No complaints there, other than the mysterious new ring that I'm pretty sure was stolen. It was vaginal theft that happened. <laughs> um, no complaints there besides the fact that there was a klepto inside my fucking vagina and he took my new ring. <laughs> What's up, you guys, and welcome back to Emotionally Online, the weekly slumber party for spilling guts and sharing secrets, hosted by yours truly, the sexiest, the one and only, Maddie Drawsbeck. And I'd like to kick off today's episode by offending a group of people that probably don't even listen to this fucking show. (laughs) Straight men, baby. Let's fucking go. YouTube says I can't say the C word in the first 30 seconds, but they did not say I could not bully straight men. So let's strap the fuck in. (laughs) I'm pretty sure the audience on this show, the demographic split is like 95% women and 5% men. Of that 5% men, I'm willing to bet that 95% of the 5% is gay men and then the remaining 5% of like maybe maybe there's a few straight men that listen to this show I'm willing to bet almost all of them are friends of mine (laughs) and not people that stumbled across the show organically but maybe I'm wrong maybe I'm totally wrong YouTube won't show me more details than that so I you know we've got to fill in the blanks here anyways straight men I've got something to say to you right here on this day And it is that I was held at gunpoint this past weekend and forced to watch a Lakers game. I'm kidding. I wasn't held at gunpoint. I did voluntarily hang out and watch this Lakers game. I sometimes get like interested in sports. Like I just, I like understanding the things that people I love enjoy. (laughs) So, you know, I've watched many sports games before because I like getting to sit there with my dad or with my brothers, with my friends and asking questions to people that enjoy it. I like seeing what other people get excited by and interested in and trying to understand it. Okay. So I was held at gunpoint if anybody's asking, but if anybody's not asking, I did voluntarily (laughs) hang out and watch this Lakers game. But my main takeaway from watching this Lakers game this past weekend was that And this is what might upset some of you. But it's that um, basketball uniforms, let's talk about it. Basketball uniforms, but really sports uniforms in general, like that's just their dance recital outfit that's been catalog ordered (laughs) and placed three months in advance so that everybody can be matching and cute. Okay, that is, I would like to start calling sports uniforms recital outfits. (laughs) That is your recital outfit that's your fucking recital outfit and you're matching with all your besties here's the thing I'm all about that I think it's so fun and so cute okay granted I think we could make sports uniforms a little bit cuter of all the sports uniforms I think that basketball is the ugliest one for sure I feel like hockey's the best then baseball then football then basketball if we're talking like the main four the fuck if I know anything about this but I'm just looking at all these tall ass men run across this little court in their little matching outfits and I'm like I just the theater kid in me has to look at that and be like okay so why was this cool in high school and theater and dance was not can anybody point out the fucking difference to me because I can't find it they're they're also doing that they're doing the same thing this is their recital outfit look at them and their cute little outfits matching running around just prancing about with their custom sneakers like is that not is this not theater is it just this is just another uh, a, a subsection of theater I felt like I was watching that being like mm, okay I received a lot of bullying as a child for being a fucking theater kid who made YouTube videos I like to maybe rewind there and say that I would either like to make the bullying even and we should also bully sports players for wearing matching outfits and prancing about or we call it even and none of us get bullied because this is theater sports are theater it's just another genre of theater 
I don't know. It all hit me as I was sitting there watching the game. I was like, there's something about this. There's something about calling it a uniform that excuses you and separates you from the fact that this is theater and this is your recital outfit, mama. Okay. That you pre-ordered custom measurements to make sure that it was perfect and you matched all the besties. I'm digging into something here. And you know what? They don't want me to dig into it. They're begging me to close my mouth on this one, but I'm ready to bust it the fuck open. Sports or theater? It's all the same. Theater is a sport. Sports are theater. And you know what? I say it's either bullying for all or bullying for none. And that is the truth. That is the truth, America. Sit in it. (laughs) Sit in that. All right? I'll put money on that take. And I'm coming back times 100 in profit. Fuck you. <laughs> All right. How's it going, you guys? How we doing? How we feeling? It's a rainy day here in New York right now. And I have been in Grind City, baby. Population me for the last two weeks because I'm trying desperately to get my life together. My friends and I do an accountability group once a month. And at the beginning of this month, I got to the meeting and I was like, I'll be fucking honest with you guys. February, hard month. Okay. We all know that February wasn't the best month for Miss Maddie Drosbeck. Um, But March, I was like, it would be insane for me to be like, February sucked. And now I'm going to go balls to the fucking wall in March. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say this is a month for going BTB baby. We're going back to basics and I'm focusing. I'm going to go to grind levels, grind city population, me, when it comes to building a routine and establishing basic habits for myself yet again, because I have just completely uh, forgotten about everything that I need to do always. I feel like I've been in a constant state of being overwhelmed for like a year. So I think we need to go back to square one and me having a shitty month in February was just like a door, a door opening to be like, okay, (laughs) I just got beat up. I just got beat up from like five different angles. So now we're going to just like rewind. I'm going to reset. I'm freshly born, brand new, suckling at the teat of life, ready to just, I don't know, get my, get my ducks back in a row here. So I've been grind city population me and it's actually been so much fun so much fun I've been going on walks a lot I went back to dance class trying to get back in a habit of going there which always makes me feel so good I went earlier today Um, I've been editing a lot I've been trying to work in different locations instead of just working in my apartment because I'm definitely more productive and just feel more excited about life when I move about Um, I've been hanging out with so many different people Uh, like goal I had for myself this month was to plan more one-on-one time with people I feel like I've been having a lot of group hangouts recently which is wonderful but I am just like I need that one-on-one connection so I've been planning a lot of one-on-one hangouts with my friends I've seen a lot of movies I've been in the movie theaters eight times this month so far and I have two more movies scheduled before the end of the month so it's a 10 movie in theaters movie month for me so clearly I've been going ham on that front as well we're going ham in our basic habits we're going ham in joy and we're also going ham in uh friendship and community and love and moving our bodies and having a good time okay and I've been doing a lot of cooking I made um uh like Mediterranean pasta salad earlier today that I also have in the fridge for the next two lunches. So a little bit of like meal prepping, would you say? Even though I'm not really, I don't really like all that. I like to be surprised by my meals every day and wake up and just see what the world has to offer me. But, um, you know, I've been trying to get out there, try some new things, get a little bit better at cooking and preparing mm, meals for myself because I'm notoriously not very good at it. Um, And we've been doing it. We've been doing the damn thing. And I'm going, I'm like rambling now, but I've been going section by section in my apartment trying to clean everything out. And I get so overwhelmed with like the big cleaning tasks. Like I feel like I'm constantly cleaning uh, just because I need to have a tidy space. But 
the things that build up, like reorganizing my drawers and the kitchen cabinets and all those things that just get like pushed off because they're behind doors that I don't have to open up all the time. Um, but I've been going like literally cabinet by cabinet trying to get everything in order. So I did all the high cabinets. Now I have to do the low cabinets. I did my bedroom closet and my bedroom drawers and underneath my bed. And now I need to do the hall closet. And I guess that's it. I guess it's just the hall closet and the under under drawers because I did my desk, my TV stand, and my bathroom. This has been like a two-month undertaking. <sighs> but it's easier when you break it up that way instead of doing it all in one go. So anyways, that is where I have been at Grind City. In case any of you have been looking for me, that's where I have been. And I've been having a good time. I've had so many interesting reflections this past few weeks I've had a lot of really good conversations in therapy with my therapist and um I don't know maybe I'm just a genetic optimist or maybe I should give myself more credit in saying that I go out of my way to try to find uh the goodness in situations to find my own happiness perhaps it's a little bit of both but I I've been reflecting a lot on how obviously uh, dealing with this period of heartache. Uh, while this period has not been fun, and if I could make this different, I would. If I could write a different story here, for sure. Um, while that is true, I have also been noticing how much like lighter in other ways this heartache feels and in some strange way that has been a nice comfort to me I'm gonna try to explain how I've been feeling and I don't know if it's gonna make sense to everyone but I, I think and this is another thing I've talked about in therapy is that I don't I'm, I don't care about that <laughs> and I don't I think that uh, prioritizing relatability is a trap and I don't need you to relate to everything that I'm going to say on here. Some of you will relate, some of you will not. And I, I'm not looking to be related to, I don't need all of you to totally understand everything I'm saying. I just speak to be listened to, to be heard, to be seen, you know, we don't need to be completely in alignment all the time. There was actually an interesting comment left on um, a podcast recently. Let me go find it because I actually thought a lot about this comment after I read it. This person said, I definitely feel like some of the attitudes I see online about censorship from younger generations are wild. Like I grew up believing all those banning books campaigns were really regressive and horrible. It's crazy to me to find younger people fall under the same antiquated line of thinking. Like to have certain issues at all present in art is bad no matter what the piece of art's argument is. Maybe it's because they think everything is promotion because that's what they've been taught all their favorite online influencing content is or that the content they watch is a reflection of themselves consumption as identity lol I'm rambling I honestly don't know and when I read this I was like this reminds me of something because when I was in college and I I was a creative writing minor and one of my poetry professors always used to say to us before we shared our poetry and like went around in the circle and you would read your piece and then you'd sit quietly while everyone critiqued it and you just observed. You didn't like butt into the conversation at all. But he said that when we were giving our feedback, good or bad, about somebody's work, we were never allowed to use the word relatable. It was like banned from use in the classroom when critiquing someone's poetry. And I went back to to that after reading this comment being like hmm that's really fucking interesting I think that social media has placed relatability at like the top level of importance when it comes to the things that we consume online and it's it's not that it shouldn't hold any importance right because I think that there is value in seeing yourself represented by the people in the media that you consume however does everything that 
we consume need to be relatable to us? Does every person that we consume need to be 100% relatable to us? No, absolutely they don't. I think that's actually like a ridiculous request to make from anyone. And also we should be actively consuming media from people that don't reflect 100% of our own life experiences. It's good to consume people that exist outside of your bubble. But I really believe that like placing relatability in the highest level importance is like desaturating a lot of our media from its value because you feel this pressure to like be a mirror to people, but I can't be a mirror to you all the time. And it makes, it it would water down my content if I tried to, you know, part of what makes, uh, you know, having like long form content where you get to consume someone just talking for an hour straight, which doing it by yourself is a feat in itself, talking on your own for an hour straight. Part of what makes that so rich is just getting to see into someone else's like inner world and being like, yeah, I relate to this part. I've experienced something similar here, but then having those moments of just sitting and listening to somebody else's experience and not projecting your own experience and whether or not you overlap on top of it. There's no right or wrong, right? We can, not relate to people, not completely resonate with 100% of their experience and still be like, okay, and fascinating. I'm sitting here and I'm listening. And I'll, most people understand that. But I do think that's just like a interesting observation of how uh, the like need for relatability is possibly uh, making people harsher critics towards um, – art towards people towards things they're consuming online and it's something that I've observed just like within comment sections both on my content and other people's content like getting people getting fired up at you uh for not being like a perfect mirror to them or making assumptions about you to make you a mirror of them when I'm not a mirror of you and your experience all the time for sure we overlap in some ways, but at the end of the day, we're both our own people and that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. So this is a reflection that I've had, some thoughts that I've had, but if you don't relate to what I'm saying, if you don't understand what I'm saying, that's okay. Just sit and listen. So anyways, side tangent aside, I have been trying to acknowledge the like two different sides of how I feel right now, where there's one part of me that of course is experiencing a heartbreak and is really sad and I have a lot of like longing and missing that's inside me just like missing my friend and missing getting to talk to this person and um, just enjoy their presence and our our relationship to each other because they um, I mean really they're just like very singular in my life um, in, in terms of how they made me feel, but also like the level of understanding I felt with this person. I just, um, yeah, I miss them. They, 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 I don't have anyone else like them in my life. So there's a lot of that, which is sad because I'm like, Ugh, ouch, my heart hurts. I miss this person. And I want to recognize and like honor that part of myself, name that part of myself. But also there's another part of me that is noticing that this heartache feels so much lighter than heartaches of my past. And there's some part of me that feels relief in knowing that heartbreak can feel this way, where I guess it's more bittersweet, where I don't feel angry. And I didn't know if I was going to start feeling angry. The last time I talked to you guys about this, it was pretty fresh. Um, it's been almost two months now. And, um, I didn't know if I was going to start feeling angry, if if there was going to be some shift in me that happened. Uh, it was going to be okay if that did happen. I didn't know. But I think when we first talked, I I was very much in the headspace of like, ouch, my heart hurts. Um, and this is like heavy and I want to put a name to how I'm feeling right now. Um, but also my gut that my gut instinct, my gut reaction there and the immediate aftermath of it was to be like, you know, how lucky was I to meet someone that meant so much to me? How lucky was I to find a connection that made me feel this way? I just had like the most fun year ever getting to know this person. And like, I have like so much fondness and love in my heart for them. 
and it feels good to to just lean on that. I mean, two months in now and realizing that that never came on for me. I never got angry. I never got upset at them in any way. Um, and talking about them um, and having people ask me about them only makes me happy. I just feel like excited to talk about my friend. That's the other part about this is that I haven't spoken to them in two months but I, I still feel like they're one of my closest friends. And I still, someone the other day asked me about, asked me about him and they didn't know anything that had happened. They also didn't even know that I liked him. They just knew he was someone that was in my life that I was close to. And they asked me about him and I was, I guess I like lit up being able to talk about my friends as I, I do with all of my friends. And, um, as I talked to this person more, gave them the update on where things are at. They were like, they seemed to be a little struck that I was like, that I seemed so happy. And they were like, explain this. Like y- you had such like a happy and excited reaction to getting to talk about them, but it actually seems like the reality of the situation is like a little bit more complicated and like emotionally loaded. And I was like, huh, that is interesting. And I I guess it's just because this heartbreak feels so different than other heartbreaks of my past. I'm not angry. I'm not um, like hurt in a personal way. I feel, I don't know. I wish things could be different, but also this is someone I care so deeply about and I want to see them win and I'm excited to get to talk about them. They're my friend, you know? There's there's no part of me that feels like upset when I'm reminded of them. There's no but that's something that I would have felt in the past with other people that I have uh you know been heartbroken by. Having their name brought up would have evoked like a uh, out of me. I would have felt like devastated or like it it just like reminds me of the situation and makes me sad. I don't feel that way with this. I feel um I don't know. I, I just feel so much more um, like love and admiration. And yeah, I don't even I don't even have words to completely describe what I'm feeling. But it's just reinforced to me like what a special connection this was is. I'm not going to speak in past tense. And. Um, has just reinforced to me um like the genuineness of how I felt, which obviously I already knew that, but it, it is, um, it's interesting to get to like move through this period and see how I start to feel differently. And in some ways I feel the exact same that I did two months ago. And in other ways I feel completely different. And, um, overall it's, it is this like bittersweet feeling of like, Mm, that hurts and I miss them terribly but oh my god how lucky am I to know someone so special it is very bittersweet I guess maybe that is the best word to describe it or just like holding space for this sadness and this longing but also like acknowledging that this person is still only associated with joy to me And there's part of me that doesn't even understand how that can be. But that's because I've never experienced a heartbreak that wasn't like deeply personal and mean. This I'm just experiencing a lot of firsts, I guess. (laughs) I'm experiencing so many firsts in this situation and like processing it. And um, yeah, having learning how to sit in this middle space of holding my sadness while also holding my like joy and love and admiration like deep deep gratefulness to have crossed paths with this person um it's an interesting time but I I wish that I could tell my past self that there there could be a time in life where heartache and like things ending and disappointment doesn't have to feel so like heavy and bad Not that this feels great. Obviously, like I said, if I could make things different, I would. But it it doesn't 
it doesn't feel as like soul crushing. But to know that there are people out there that will see you and understand you and love you so completely and when things don't go the way you think they will or the way you want them to, you don't have to feel broken. You can feel that hurt, you can feel the disappointment, but it doesn't have to like change the way you see yourself and be like a knock to your self-esteem. That you can hold space for like a heartbreak that is more bittersweet and that feels kind. I wrote in my journal, I said, I guess I've only experienced heartache that felt hurtful, that felt mean. Not hurting because I cared, but hurting because they didn't care. And right now I'm hurting because we both care. And it's so beautiful and it feels so comforting. And this calmness I feel about it all two months in, I just think that it's helping me trust that I am right where I'm meant to be right now. And isn't that beautiful? Not to be like such a fucking... (laughs) But like, isn't it? (sighs) I just, I, the more time that passes, the more struck I am with like, Yeah, just gratitude and admiration for um, this person. I think right now I'm just trying to focus on trusting the universe, trusting that everything works out the way it's meant to work out, and there's no use getting super caught up in where things are right now, how I feel right now. I think it's a beautiful thing to like enjoy yourself and enjoy your emotions at every stage. But I also don't want, I I want to just accept that, like, I have no idea what the next year of my life is going to hold for me. And I have to trust that, like, what's happening now is meant to happen now. And that maybe it'll make more sense to me in the future why this time period had to happen. I just have to trust that it'll make more sense someday. All right, we've got so many audience submissions, so let's just dive in here, okay? If you don't know, there's a submission box where you can submit anything and everything you want to the show. Is there internet drama you need me to chime in on? You let a bitch know. Interpersonal dramas, secrets, things you want to get off your chest, am I the assholes, anything at all, you drop it in the box. Listen, we are in a circle swapping secrets in our slumber bags. Don't forget it, bitch. All right, let's go. Hi, Maddie. I've been a listener for a while now, and your podcast has really helped me emerge from being a covert lover girl to taking pride in my sensitivity and romanticism. I'd love your take and advice on a recent situation with my boyfriend. We've been together for about eight months, and it's my first real relationship. He's kind, intelligent, and always makes me feel heard and safe. Up until now, I've never had any real issues with our relationship other than the minor frustrations that come with being with someone that's very different from you. Recently, we were discussing ideal types, preferences, celebrity crushes, and a partner in a conversation initiated by him. I think I was kind of vague about it because for me, attraction is very emotion-based and has less to do with the physical attributes. I'm more attracted to my partner now than I was at the start of our relationship because of our emotional intimacy. He, on the other hand, was a lot more definite in the ideal physical attributes a partner would have. He says he prefers a fit build, and for all the celebs he mentioned, he was drawing attention to their flat stomachs and toned legs. The more he talked, I could feel my heart sinking as these women looked nothing like me. I'm not plus size, but I certainly don't have a flat stomach or abs either and have always been on the curvier side. I asked him outright if he'd be more attracted to me if I lost weight, and when pushed, he said that he would. Mm, I'm really sorry. I was super upset by this comment as I have struggled with body confidence since I was a teenager and have had a poor relationship with exercise and food. He was unaware of the extent of this at the time. The next day we discussed it again as I wanted time to reflect. He assured me that he finds me attractive as I am now. We have an active sex life and in the past he's been complimentary of my body so I don't think he's lying about that. I don't have a problem with him having preferences that don't correspond with my own appearance. It's more the fact that he'd be happier with me if I changed the way I looked that's getting me down. I know that if he gained slash lost weight, it wouldn't make me more or less attracted to him. I guess my questions are whether I'm justified in taking it so badly, whether it's a valid comment for him to make, and how do we move past this? The whole thing has made me very insecure in my body again. I've avoided undressing in front of him and now only feel comfortable having sex with the lights off, which were never issues for me before. 
I know he is upset that his comment hurt me and I want to know the best way to work through this as it's unfair to both of us for me to hold on to this resentment after he's apologized and I've accepted. I'd love to hear any thoughts on this and also more general thoughts on pushing for answers you might not want to hear. Is it always right to be truthful even though it may hurt your partner? Let me start off here by saying I'm so sorry that this was said to you and you're not crazy. You're not overreacting. I would have reacted the same way that you did. And I think this is objectively like a really cruel thing to say to someone, to anyone, whether or not you have a history of struggling with body image or not. I don't even think the fact that he didn't know that matters because this is a mean thing to say regardless. Um, It's also just like such a terrible thing to say to a partner that you're emotionally and physically intimate with. I... Yeah, I struggle to understand people whose brains move in this way, that people think this way about people they claim to love, um, because I really do see it as, like, just so, so deeply shitty. And I'm going to have more passionate takes on something like this because of my own history with body image and um, how close topics like this hit to my heart. So I'm going to try really hard to be gentle in my response here because I can tell you really care about this person. But geez, this is a tough one. I will never be able to understand people who think like this, who have it in them to judge anyone, let alone judge someone they love. Um, by like nitpicking their bodies. I think that is so terrible and it says more about them than it ever will about you. But I just can't fathom why you would treat other people like that. And I think so often people will disguise their shittiness as being, oh, it's just a preference. And I am personally tired of it and I think these people need to learn how to be fucking nicer and adjust their worldview a little bit I just can't imagine loving someone and wanting to be with them and looking at them and telling them that I would like them more if they looked different that hurts that breaks my heart for you I just don't I don't think that's how you speak to people that you love And you don't have to feel the same way that I feel about this. But I personally would not be able to recover from something like this in a relationship. I want to be with someone that loves me. All of me. I don't want to be with someone who loves me with conditions. That would love me more if I fit their narrow idea of beauty. I don't want to be with someone that views bodies that way. It just feels so icky and gross to me. I worked so hard to get away from that way of thinking. I can't date someone that thinks that way. I can't date someone that would look at me and think that I would be 1% hotter if I lost weight. I, I can't. And so when you ask how to work through this, The truth is that I don't know what to tell you because I wouldn't work through it. And you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to feel the way that I feel. But to me, that's not how you speak to people that you love. And I wouldn't want to be with someone that would nitpick me in that way. That would make me feel bad. I want to be with someone that looks at me like I am everything that they're so lucky that they got me. If I knew that the person that I was with was looking at me and nitpicking all the things they wish were slightly different, I would absolutely lose it. And I just believe that I deserve better than that because I would never do that to someone that I loved. Never. Wouldn't cross my fucking brain. And I want to be with someone that it wouldn't cross their brain either. It's not how I see bodies. It's not how I see beauty. It's not how I appreciate the people that I love. And I am actually, uh, I just don't understand people that 
see the world like that and see bodies like that and have such like rigid ideas of beauty and thinking that you would be 2% hotter if only you did this. Like I just, it, it riles me up and I, it, it is upsetting and it is, it makes me so sad that they see the world that way, but also that they said something like that to you and now you are in the position of like having to process what they said and just move on with it because you've accepted their apology. Like this is a devastating thing to learn about your partner. Not only did they say something like that to you, but now you're learning more about like their, their worldview, how they see bodies, how they see (sighs) beauty. Like uh, the physical is so fucking unimportant to me. I can't, I don't relate to these people. I don't. And it makes me mad. And I I feel like I'm even getting like tongue tied talking about this because I get mad. I get so mad at these people that treat other people this way because of nitpicking body image. Oh, I'd like you 2% better if you had toned legs. Shut the fuck up. Oh, I just, it's, it's horrible to me. And, you know, I appreciate that you are trying to um, be in a place where you have forgiven them because you accepted their apology. I appreciate that you want to make sure that you are aligned with what you've said. You've accepted the apology, so now you've got to get with it a little bit here. But I want to say to you that you don't have to rush yourself to accept this and be okay with this situation if you are not there. What was said was incredibly hurtful and it goes beyond just this like one isolated incident because you learn something about how they see bodies, their like worldview. Also learning that a partner would like love you less because of such minor things like a toned leg. Like I just can't, I cannot fathom claiming to love someone and then making them feel like shit because of that. That is like unforgivable to me. You don't have to agree with me. I'm not trying to make you agree with me. I know that I'm getting passionate about this and it's because I, (sighs) if you find in your processing of this that you can't move past this, I want you to know that that's fair. But if you find in your processing of this that you are able to trust in the love and attraction your partner has for you again and you're able to build back from this moment, then great. I'm so happy for you. But it's going to be a process if that's what you're choosing to do. This is really fucking painful, especially with your history with body image. I just, uh, oh, I want to box something right now. (laughs) Makes me so angry. It's just like not fair that this was said to you. It's not fair that you have to sit with this and it's not fair that now you're feeling like you have to rush and get it together and feel differently about what they said to you. What they said to you was cruel. It was fucking cruel, regardless of if they knew about your history with your body or not. You do not speak to people like that. You don't treat people like that. You don't, it's fucked up to look at bodies like that as if we're not always fucking changing. And to think if you're going to try to be in a long-term relationship with someone, the physical is fleeting, baby. If we're hung up on toned legs now, does it get better in the future? Like it just seems so fucked up to me. I can't. I really fucking can't. So So I don't know what I would do if I were you because I understand you really love this person and it's easy for me to sit here and be like, well, fuck that. Right. But if I was you, I don't know what I would do. I really don't think that I could recover from it because it is such like a deep, like deep held core belief of mine at the center of every part of who I am lies this. So I don't know how I could go back from this. I don't know what your next move is here or how to get to the other side of it. All that I have to say to you is that you don't need to rush yourself to get to the other side of it. And you don't need to be okay with this tomorrow. And just because they apologized and you accepted it doesn't mean that you need to magically be okay with it and be like this never happened and it doesn't impact you. This was a really mean and cruel thing that they did. I don't have the answers for you. I just want you to honor your emotions and show up for yourself instead of smushing down how you feel and moving on faster than you are ready to move on.
all for their sake because they feel bad. They hurt your feelings. They should feel bad. They hurt your feelings. You don't need to put how you feel in a box and try to speed up your processing here because they feel bad. They made you feel bad. Shouldn't have made you feel bad then. I don't feel bad for them in this situation. (laughs) Whoever you are, wherever you are out there, I just want you to know that I'm on your team fucking completely. I would feel exactly the way that you feel and you are entitled to all of the emotions that you're feeling right now and you absolutely do not have to rush through and processing them or getting to the other side of it. It's fucked up. It is fucked up. And I just hope that you can go through the healing that you need to process all of this um, regardless of your partner. I'm actually totally not concerned about your partner at all whatsoever. I'm concerned about you and making sure that you're able to process this and feel good about yourself again. I'm rooting for you. And you're beautiful just as you are today. And there are plenty, plenty, plenty of people on earth that think that and would see it that way. And I just hope that you're being gentle with yourself and your heart in this time. You're beautiful and wonderful and deserving of love and admiration and devotion from someone who loves you as you are today. Damn it. (laughs) We knew that was going to happen one of these days. I just fucking spilled my drink. Hello, Maddie. I just wanted to send you this because I immediately thought of you when I saw it and it might make you smile a little. Don't really have anything to spill. Just wanted to share and didn't know where. So maybe you'll be able to see it. Have a great day. Love your content. And what they sent me was a link to a Tumblr post, which was of a photo of a car and the bumper sticker says honk if you're a lover. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up on the show is because this is actually a full circle moment. And whoever submitted this, I, I hope you're going to love what I'm about to tell you <laughs> more than anything I've ever said on this show before. But I know who who drives that car. I know the person whose car that is and who who has that bumper sticker. And I need you to know that it's the photographer that shot that cover art for this fucking podcast. <laughs> that is really blonde's car who is the photographer that shot the cover artwork for this show so isn't that like a wonderful full circle moment that you saw something on the internet and you were like oh this is so maddie this is so emotionally online let me send this to her and i'm like oh don't worry bestie seen that know whose car that is and actually they worked on the cover art for this very podcast life is beautiful in that way full circle moment it's a small world after all like isn't that awesome I loved that I loved seeing this in the submission box and being like oh I'm excited to tell you something that you don't know (laughs) hello Maddie love everything you do and your words always make me feel more comfortable in myself I turned 20 in November still a virgin I don't feel any way towards it at times I'm embarrassed that out of my closest friends I'm the only one who hasn't had sex yet nor even had any kind of intimacy or romance with another person The biggest problem I'm facing, though, is although I would enjoy sex, I am genuinely so scared of it. Raised Catholic, if I were to get pregnant, I think I would actually die, and that fear is such a driving force in my non-active sex life. I know people have sex and don't get pregnant all the time. I just feel like with my luck, I would have sex once and boom, pregnancy. I guess I'm just wondering if you could say anything to calm my anxiety, no matter how weird it may be. Not weird at all. Do you know how many times I've given this spiel to people in my life? To my sister, to my friends, to tons of people, acquaintances. Like the amount of times, I think once you're over the age of like 25, let's say, you've already had like within your immediate social circle at least like five different pregnancy scares where you've had to talk someone off the ledge being like you're not pregnant you're not pregnant you're not pregnant odds are you're not pregnant let's fucking relax you guys it's anxiety that's delaying your period (laughs) um and uh so I've I've given this spiel a hundred times in my life I've had to give it to myself several times in my life one time more prominently which I'm pretty sure I've talked about on the show before but when I was like a sophomore year when I was like a sophomore in college I had sex with someone and you know went about my life and I was on the nuvering at the time that was my chosen form of birth control and it was like at the end of that cycle 
I went to take the Nuvering out so I could start my period and the Nuvering was just not fucking in. And I was like, oh, uh, where the fuck is it? So I was in my head like, okay, either somehow my Nuvering got shoved so far up inside me that my stubby little fingers can't reach it or I haven't had a Nuvering in this whole time. Somehow it fell out. Not sure how it would have done that. And um, I could be pregnant now because I've I've had sex. Maybe. I don't know what the guy had sex with, though. I'm pretty sure I always made him wear condoms because we were never that close. So he was probably wearing a condom as well. But I was having a panic attack because for me, I need like two forms of protection in order to not have a panic attack. And one of them was just magically not inside me my birth control mm, vanished into thin air and um I was always in my head like maybe it like it fell somewhere you know I I searched through all my bedding to be like is it in my bed like was it is it like in my duvet cover and it I just didn't notice it because I don't know it fell out during sex or something which happens but usually when I had the nuvering in and it would follow during sex the person that I was with would just hand it to me and because you can take it out during sex and put it back in afterwards and it'll be fine but that never happened he never was like oh this came out take it (laughs) what do you want me to do with this so I was having panic attacks and I took like a bunch of pregnancy tests and then I booked um, an appointment at Planned Parenthood. The only one that had like immediate appointments was the one on Staten Island because at the time I, my like gynecologist was still back in Massachusetts. So I didn't have like doctors in New York that I could go to. So I went to Planned Parenthood, literally took the fucking Staten Island ferry with my roommates at the time. I was having panic attacks, crying on the Staten Island ferry, going to Planned Parenthood because I needed them to look inside me and see if the new ring was shoved all the way up and I just like couldn't reach it or what. Anyways, there was no new ring inside me. To this day, I do not know where that Nuvering went. I seem to, my hypothesis here is that that man took a little souvenir for himself home. That it fell out during sex and he thought, you know what? Let me keep this because he was a fucking freak. And he ended up being really weird. So I wouldn't put it past him if in his museum of artifacts, you know, of lover's past, he has my Nuvering. (laughs) <laughs> that is my that is my accusation that I'm making here on this day. Anyways, so when that happened to me, I had to give myself a whole spiel to like calm myself down about the odds of me being pregnant. I've had to give this spiel to many people in my life. So those are my credentials. Take it or leave it. <laughs> the wonderful thing about sex in the modern age is that we have so many ways to protect ourselves from unwanted pregnancy. So birth control. Woo. We love birth control. Huge supporters of birth control over a year. Obviously hormonal birth control isn't going to be for everyone. If that's not something that you want to do for sure, don't have to do it. But if you are interested in birth control, I highly recommend it. I've been on several forms of birth control, finding the one that worked the best for me. I was on the pill in high school, which made me super depressed. And then I got an IUD my like freshman year of college, right before I went to college. And my body rejected that bitch. So I had a really bad experience with the IUD. (laughs) And my body rejected it. So it got lodged in my uterus and I bled for like eight months straight. I was supposed to go at like six months for a checkup to make sure everything was good. But I was in college at the time. It's normal to spot for like six months. Um, I was heavy spotting for about eight months though. I don't know. Yeah. A lot of questions about that period of time in my life, but, uh, that was terrible. And then after when they realized it was lodged, they were like, yeah, so your body rejected it. We could try it a second time, but odds are your body will do the same thing. And I was like, fuck that. I actually would love to not bleed for a year and a half. (laughs) Thanks. And, um, so that was a wrap. And then I went on the Nuvering for like four years and I really loved the Nuvering while I was on it. No complaints there other than the mysterious Nuvering that I'm pretty sure was stolen. It was vaginal theft that happened. <laughs> um, no complaints there besides the fact that there was a klepto inside my fucking vagina and he took my Nuvering. 
<laughs> um, but then I had, you know, I've notoriously had a million period issues throughout my life. And, um, I was having like month long periods and I was like, is the nuva ring doing this? Like if I switch birth control, will this stop, hap- stop happening? So then I switched back to being on the pill, um, trying a different, uh, version of the pill, a different dosage than I tried when I was in high school. And that's what I've been on since. And the pill that I'm on now has been great. My period is next to nothing now. Um, magically. And it, it, it's been great. It's worked for me. And it took a while to find what worked for me. But now I feel like I'm cruising. And it's been great. So if you want to be on birth control, there are plenty of options out there. Trial and error. Finding which which form of birth control is right for you. Great. That's one layer of protection. Condoms, another layer of protection. I like having two layers of protection. Just makes me feel the most confident, the most safe, the least likely to have an anxiety attack after sex because I would like to enjoy myself if I'm having sex and not panic. So I like to have birth control and condoms. Usage of both going on here. But if you don't feel comfortable going on birth control and you only want to use condoms, condoms are wonderfully effective. So you should feel really confident that you're not going to be pregnant if you are using protection. However, accidents happen. Things occur. Nuva rings get snatched directly out of your orifices. (laughs) So if you find yourself in a situation where the protection that you have tried to implement doesn't work, I would always try to remind myself that... In order to get pregnant, the whole process, when you lay it out, it actually sounds really complicated and like it would be hard that it would happen, right? Because in order for a pregnancy to occur, we've got to have an egg present. It's got to be in there. You've got to have an egg present within your uterus. Now, the egg isn't present all the time. There's only a select few days out of the month where eggs would be present there. So it's got to happen on the days where there's eggs present and you've got to have sperm that gets enough speed that is talented enough to swim all the way there and fertilize an egg, which maybe it wasn't. Maybe he didn't do that good. (laughs) Maybe he's got slow swimmers. You know what I mean? We've got a whole like track team auditioning here and there might not even be trophies at the end. So it's like, Odds there's eggs there. Odds the sperm makes it and actually fertilizes one of those eggs that may or may not even be there. Like, yes, pregnancies do happen. And taking precautions to protect yourself is going to lower those chances exponentially. Do accidents still happen? Breakthroughs still happen for sure. But the odds of that are pretty slim. It's hard to get pregnant for the most part. People try to get pregnant for months on months on months, you know? You could be the miracle person that gets pregnant the very first time that something goes wrong in that protection, but odds are that's not what's going to happen. Odds are if you protect yourself, if you take those precautions, you won't end up pregnant. And maybe a breakthrough happens. And even if it does, you still probably won't get pregnant because it's actually kind of hard to get pregnant. (laughs) And a lot of things have got to line up for that to be true. So I really wouldn't worry that much about it. If you're taking the proper precautions, if you're on birth control or you're using condoms or both, even better, you're not going to get pregnant. Don't worry about it. Odds are so slim of that happening. So go out and enjoy yourself. Have good sex. Use protection. Wear a condom. um, And you'll be good. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. We have these wonderful advancements at our fingertips that we're able to prevent pregnancy um, in in very easy and accessible ways. At a lot of colleges and doctor's offices, they give condoms away for free. Um, Planned Parenthood's, I'm pretty sure they give them away for free too. So listen, resources are out there. I wouldn't be too worried about it. It's, it's pretty it's pretty difficult to get pregnant all things considered especially when we've got so many you know resources for protection at our fingertips i've got to run because i'm headed to a movie screening that i was invited to
it's gay it's really all i know (laughs) don't know much else heard it was a gay movie and knew i was all in (laughs) so i've gotta get my booty over to the movie theaters to go watch a gay movie and enjoy myself so Love you guys so much. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'm going to have my good friend Meg Rocco. I'm going to have my good friend Meg Ruoco on the pod next week. Incredible guest. So stay tuned. Get excited because the besties are back. Okay. It's bestie hours, baby. And um, we're going to have a great time. So get excited. I'll see you guys next week.